Great. Thanks, all of you, for uh, participating today and appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the things that we're doing here in the state of Ohio in relationship to trying to trying to measure water quality effects of agricultural practices at the edge of the field. Um, what we want to talk a little bit today is some of the methods that we're using here in the state of Ohio to get that done. Uh, talk about site losses of nitrate nitrogen as well as dissolved reactive phosphorus. Uh, we'll do a little bit of study comparison looking at treatments and what effects they are having both positive and negative in relationship to uh, nitrogen and phosphorus loss. And uh, then just a couple comments on monitoring. Um, obviously, if we want to know if we're making progress towards uh, goals in relationship to improving water quality, the ideal of monitoring is really critical. So for today's session, uh, really an important topic as we try and advance what we do from an agricultural perspective. Um, first off, I just want to give you a description of what we're doing here in the state of Ohio. Um, we have these edge of field sites uh, located where the black dots are. Um, you can see that that represents really the tiled area of the state of Ohio, at least the intensively tiled area in the state. Uh, basically, we have 20 sites in the state that are being monitored and we're doing a paired field design. So we have two fields at each site that provide us uh, the comparison of practices. Um, those sites have a wide range of characteristics, uh, 9 to 380 part per million Maley 3 soil test. Uh, they represent really the main production area in Northwest Ohio, and that would be the lake bed soils that we have up in Northwest Ohio. Um, tillage is, as you can imagine, working with farmers, uh, really each farm has their own system of tillage and the way they manage that, uh, but we can kind of categorize it in these rough categories. Uh, we do have these uh, sampling sites, uh, at least the monitoring equipment is in a protected structure, um, heated, so we are doing 365 day per year sampling and getting all flows that come off of an individual site. Um, I need to mention and acknowledge uh, that most of this work or the primary lead for this is our USDA ARS soil drainage unit in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Dr. Kevin King leads that although he would acknowledge the list of partners there, and I'm sure we're missing a few on that, that it's a very extensive project with those uh, basically 40 fields that are being monitored and a lot of people have had um, impact in relationship to um, funding and, and working with those sites and some of the data from the sites. Kevin has been very gracious in uh, providing that as we try and advance science in understanding ag practices. Um, what a paired field site looks like is something like what you're seeing here, where we have a uh, basically a tiled field um, here and here. Um, those two fields, uh, we know what the tile layout is for them and can account for the subsurface uh, drainage that's coming into that tile system. Um, over that, we have an overlaying surface area that gives us a watershed um, within the field. And uh, basically then what we're doing is monitoring both the subsurface um, tile water as well as the surface water coming off of those sites uh, using ISCO samplers. Um, gives us uh, that opportunity to sample at an intensity that can allow us to break down events and understand what's going on from an event standpoint. Um, we are looking at these sites and you can see there that the um, uh, areas for the different uh, uh, flows from subsurface and surface can be a little bit different, but uh, we account for that and in, in what we talk about as far as understanding or summarizing the results. Uh, we are uh, sampling for phosphorus, uh, both total and dissolved reactive or soluble phosphorus, uh, nitrate, nitrogen, as well as ammonia, ammonium. And uh, then we're doing suspended solids, hydrologic flows and precipitation to understand what's going on in relationship to water movement offsite. Uh, these are some of the practices that were being, um, are being monitored at these sites across the, the state of Ohio. Um, we're looking at for our nutrient practices. Uh, we're looking at nutrient source. And when we talk about source, we're primarily talking about manure versus fertilizer. Haven't gotten down to uh, different uh, fertilizer types from a commercial availability standpoint. Um, cover crops, crop rotation, tillage, gypsum, pea precipitating filters, control drainage, two-stage ditches, vegetative cover, um, all of those are things that we have collected data on and at least have 
uh, one um, comparison that we can uh, share with folks. Um, you can see that it involves both in-field, edge-of-field, as well as in-stream practices. And really, that's important, um, including that um, in-stream practice because of the impact that we know that we can have um, from the standpoint of sloughing off of ditch banks and, and other things are, are things that we need to consider as we talk about non-point source contributions to a watershed. Um, I want to share with you a little bit of data now, and actually this is a lot of data, and we could probably spend 15 minutes talking about this uh, slide in and of itself. But uh, basically what we have is uh, the sites uh, talking about nitrate nitrogen losses on the left-hand side, DRP losses or dissolved reactive phosphorus on the right-hand side. And uh, what we have is uh, then these individual sites, uh, site A, um, would be one of those 20 sites to site T. And uh, as you look at um, whether it's the left-hand side or the right-hand side, site A is the same field that we're looking at. Um, and site T would be the same field that we're looking at uh, losses. A um, couple things to note here. Um, first of all, the dark area of each bar is the tile contribution. The um, open area is the surface contribution for that nutrient. Um, we do have water years 2015 to 2018 represented here. And then the very bottom chart is the mean annual for all sites for all years that they have been monitored. Uh, you can see the scaling um, is one important thing to note. And when we're talking about nitrate nitrogen losses, we're talking zero to basically 150 is on the top end pounds of uh, per acre of loss per year. Um, when we talk about DRP or dissolved reactive phosphorus, we're talking about something less than three pounds of loss in relationship to an annual loss. And you can see um, that that does vary from field to field. And so we do get a sense that there are management practices going on, characteristics of a field that really do contribute in relationship to nutrient losses. I, I tell you the highest losses on like a, a field C there is a situation where we are applying manure applications and then we're applying commercial fertilizer on top of that and, and seeing losses that total up to 150 pounds per acre on an annual basis. Uh, something that certainly is a, a pocketbook issue from a farmer standpoint. Uh, when we get over to DRP, we can see that a lot of the losses are coming from tile systems and um, then um, those losses do vary from field to field. Um, the red line does give us an ideal of a target level that we have in relationship to the Western Lake Erie Basin. It's 0 0.05 parts per million. And we can see that uh, there are practices in relationship to um, what we implement out in the field that uh, do fall below that. And then we have some fields that fall very much above that. Um, that highest field as far as contributions that you see, site B, is that highest soil test uh, level. We've got 380 part per million male lake three soil test, and thus you're seeing that kind of losses there. I um, want to get then into talking about some individual practices, and uh, these are the four that we're going to talk about and uh, show some results from the comparison plots that we have. Um, first, let's take a look at uh, source and look at manure versus fertilizer. And what we have here is a uh, site where we have uh, dairy manure that was applied on one field, a map that was applied on the second field. And uh, what we have is there was an equal application of 76 pounds of P2O5 per acre that was applied. Uh, we have dissolved reactive phosphorus and total phosphorus here. I'm just going to focus in on dissolved reactive phosphorus um, in, in this case. And uh, what we have is event concentration, and then we have event loading, and that loading is expressed in pounds per acre. The A and B chart here that you're looking at, what those are, are the baseline periods. So this would be field one, field two. Um, as we look at these box and whisker charts, the mean is right here in the middle of that box or um, within the box, the single line. And we can see that both fields were reacting very similar um, from both the event concentration standpoint as well as a total loading standpoint in pounds per acre prior to uh, making that application. After the application, we can take a look at the, the information and see that really even after the application, um, both fields are reacting very similarly. There's not a different uh, mean 
uh, for either the loading or for the event, event concentration. So the ideal that uh, in this case of liquid manure being and liquid dairy manure applied at 13,000 gallons per acre um, was not a worse source of, from a loss standpoint at edge of field than what the map was um, from a product standpoint. They were equal in loss. Um, one other thing that we can take a look at here is manure rate. We do have a study, um, actually two years, where we were applying a full rate versus a half rate of dairy manure. Um, here what we get is a um, representation of the full rate and we have discharge, total phosphorus loading, the dissolved reactive loading, as well as the nitrate loading uh, for the full rate versus the half rate. Uh, what we see here is actually the full rate, uh, we had a little more discharge than what we did with the half rate. Um, differences in field um, is being represented there. Uh, then here we actually have where the total phosphorus was higher with the half rate than the lower um, rate. Um, we also see where DRP was very similar. Uh, we do see a little difference in nitrate, nitrogen losses and a little higher in relationship to um, the uh, full rate versus the half rate. So the results that you're seeing here would say that uh, there's not a big impact as far as in the realm that we're talking about of seven versus 14,000 gallons of dairy manure um, as far as loss of nutrient is concerned. I would call these uh, fairly similar as we um, judge what's going on here. So not, a, not necessarily a huge benefit. I, I think the benefit you know, what we might see is if we double that rate of 14,000 to 28,000, um, that's where we start to, I think, see and, and could identify some issues and, and is something that we really need to avoid from an application standpoint is those over application situations. Uh, we can talk a little bit about fall versus uh, spring manure applications, a very similar setup chart or setup to the chart that we have here where we have the fall application, the spring application, and what we see is a reduction of discharge uh, with the spring application. Uh, once again, we got to account for differences in um, fields. And then we also see where total phosphorus was less, DRP was less, and nitrates were less um, in relationship to that spring application over fall. Um, but then also looking at the numbers of nitrate in particular, that's a fairly high loss, 239 pounds per acre. Um, so, um, you know, thinking about what we do in relationship to matching manure application to following crop and trying to reduce those nitrate losses is still something um, that we need to put in play. And certainly one of those practices that we think about for that is cover crops. And uh, here we have a, um, one of our field trials, uh, actually it was the same plots where we were talking about the half rate of dairy manure application where we were using a mustard, um, actually white mustard was uh, planted as a cover crop. Uh, we had the different gallonage flows and then um, what we're seeing here is um, in the upper part of this chart is actually what the water looks like coming off the site. Um, here's what you're seeing as far as the no cover crop and where um, you know, we can account for the tile water. Um, we can see that most of the water does come out of this field site through the tile um, and surface is just a small constituent coming off. Um, then we can account for the evapotranspiration of the crop, evaps, evapotranspiration of the cover crop, and there is some uh, unaccounted for water that leaves the site. Um, over here where we have the cover crop, we can account for um, an increase there that actually does show up as far as a change in discharge where we have um, less um, discharge coming off 5.1 inches versus 7.9 um, for the no cover crop area. We can see nitrates were reduced substantially, 74% reduction there. Uh, DRP in this case was reduced by 33%, although um, it does We'll have a story to tell about uh, phosphorus a little bit later uh, with the next slide. Um, and then we can see just uh, about an in one inch uh, difference, 4% difference as far as evapotranspiration over the years. So um, what we see with cover crops is reduce, reduce, reduction in tile flow, reduction in nitrates, and reduction in DRP. 
Um, this would be a cover crop uh, in this case, and this would be with a standard nitrogen program in a corn situation. Um, just hit the highlights down here where we did see a reduction of 70% in nitrates. Here we actually saw an increase in DRP, and uh, that's kind of the story. Cover crops do a very good job as far as nitrate um, sequestration on site. Uh, when we talk about DRP, uh, very mixed results, and we'll see that uh, throughout a lot of the cover crop work that's going on that evaluates uh, uh, what we see as far as phosphorus losses. Um, this is uh, a summary of uh, four paired field study sites uh, where we're looking at uh, uh, really nitrate losses or reductions of 92 to 71 percent is the range. Uh, DRP um, reductions uh, can range from a minus 90 percent to a positive 39 percent. Uh, so cover crops benefit us a great deal from a nitrate management standpoint. I threw in a slide, um, annual crops, and when we talk about livestock farms, often we have, uh, you know, hay crops, uh, alfalfa crops, and um, here's a couple of case studies that look at alfalfa uh, versus a annual rotation, and uh, what we're seeing here is some pretty good reductions of nitrate, DRP, and total phosphorus by having that perennial crop um, in the rotation, so um, certainly perennial crops give us a um, way to control and work with water quality. Um, the ideal of measuring at the edge of field can be a costly type of thing that we have uh, in place. And uh, there is a range of um, different practices out there as far as what we're using um, with the ISCO samplers that provides continuous uh, monitoring. Uh, there is some systems that we've been working with as a comparison that are looking at kind of a reduced cost um, versus you know, five to 7,000 for this equipment versus 25 to 30,000 for this equipment over here at a single location. And because the disadvantage with this, it becomes a composite sample. And so um, with that composite sample, it's a, it doesn't give us that event information to the detail that we can break out what's happening um, over a um, individual rainfall um, event that's occurring. Um, for that, we do have a lower cost as far as some of those annual costs. And then, you know, low tech is even a great way to get some information. Going out with a bucket and a, a stopwatch, we can actually come up with the, um, a concentration, then a flow rate, and come up with pounds of loss, um, recognizing that that's a spot sample. Although we can do this on a regular time interval basis and start to put together a story of practices. So um, just would encourage us to think about how we do measurement at edge of field.